morning and welcome uh, to a dark and ominous Juma Private Game Reserve on this Sunrise Safari on Safari Live. My name is Brent Neosmith. Smith. I have Dangerous Dave on camera and we have Steph and Jandre out on foot. So Wendy has been retired for today while the tech team take her apart and try to get her up and running. So you with Steph and myself. Steph will be out when it's light enough to walk till then, you're with Dave and myself. And we have uh, Rebecca and Louise in final control. And out of nowhere at about 2 a.m. this morning, the heavens are opened. Now, everyone says, no, it never rains during the winter in, in the Lowfeld. That is not true in my experience. It always rains at least twice when you least expect it. And uh, this morning was one of those. And uh, I had to come from my camp in the open a game drive vehicle and I got a wet bottom but fortunately I think it's dry now and you can see how dark it is look at those clouds but the rain has stopped fortunately just in time for the sunrise safari and it looks like it might be clearing a little bit in the east but we will see how we go hopefully we'll be able to give you a full safari and uh, let's get going and see what is out in the darkness When I drove through from um, our house to camp this morning, it was literally like this, trying to hide from the rain. You can see how wet the top of my hoodie hood on my jacket is, trying to uh, avoid getting wet. And uh, I failed dismally. But one of the things about driving an open vehicle in the rain is, is you can't really, you don't really have anywhere to hide. But fortunately, it stopped before game drive. Oh, hello, little impalers. Let's get the lights off. There we go. Quite eerie without the lights on. Dark. On a positive note, this is great cat weather. And uh, a strong possibility that from two till about half past five, the leopards and lions might have caught something with that wind and rain. And it's not that cold uh, due to all the cloud cover. It's about 16 degrees Celsius, 61 Fahrenheit. And you can see, I don't even have my mitts on, even though it was raining. Not that cold. There's my spotty lighty uh, in my lap. I think this weather is going to dissipate quite quickly. Um, we have got our rain covers on, so you might have a scratching on the canvas, just in case the heavens decide to open again. Aaron saying it's weirdly quiet at Juma this morning. And I assume Aaron is talking about the dam cam. Uh, that is true, this weather would have slowed things down a bit. The birds are gonna get going a bit later. It's only gonna be light a little bit later. So everything should kick into gear in about 20 minutes, Aaron. Morning, Austin. Austin says, what time do I get up in the morning? Because he says it seems like it's, I've been up for a while with all my energy. Well, Austin, at this time of the year, I wake up at about five. Uh, and uh, I come through at about 5.15 from my house to the main camp. And then at 5.30, we're on the vehicles, getting everything ready to go live at six. But in summer, we can get up as early as four. So winter's quite nice, we get a bit of a sleep in. The 
Now I'm just checking the area where we last saw Bruna's tracks a few days ago. Who knows, maybe we'll have luck as the leopards continue to evade. It's been almost a week with no leopards. Lots of lions, cheetah yesterday, but no leopards. Normally by now it's light enough that we don't need the spotlight. So because of the cloud cover, we do so. Hopefully you'll see some eyes shining back at us shortly. And if we do see any tracks, they're gonna be really fresh because they're gonna to have to be on top of the rain, so within the last 20 minutes. Now, it wasn't very much rain, I'd say about a mil and a half, two mils at the most. So just enough to settle the dust, so to speak. Hi, Joey, in the land of Oz. Uh, Joey says, please could you find me a stork today? And any, any species will do, but a black stork is my favorite. Joey, the likelihood of us seeing a black stork today is very minimal. That they move through this area during the summer months and we are in the depths of winter, although you would never say so with the rain we had. Uh, so we will, we will try, I think our best chance is it maybe a saddle build stalk? And the only stalks that are true, sort of resident around here, the rest of the stalks pass through. And we get occasionally white stalks, and adlum stalks, black stalks, and of course the saddle build stalk. Those are our four main stalk species. There's always a slim chance at a yellow build stalk, but really, really uncommon in this part of the world. And there's also, sorry, not there, and also, well, with the lack of water around, it's, it's less likely. There's always a chance of possibly an open build storm. See, off to the east, the sky is clearing a bit. So hopefully it continues to do so. And here we go, you can see the clouds actually moving quite quickly. But if we head a little bit further to the east, or to the, sorry, to the south, Dave, and we zoom in there, you see there are still some big clouds around, and that's where the weather's coming from. Let's hope it stays away. It's not light enough that I don't need this. Just for that half light where you think a spotlight's a good idea, but it's actually not. Uh, you can actually see more with your eyes. See how dark it is to the west in comparison. I think they're still getting rained on. So we're heading 
east now. I'm going to go check our eastern boundary. So there were a lot of lion tracks yesterday. Unfortunately, we had no luck with them. But hopefully, fingers crossed, we are abound today. Also, always a good spot to check for Queen Cooler down our southern boundary. So, I'm one of those lucky people. So when my feet hit the ground, uh, whether it's midday or, or five in the morning, I'm just as awake all the time. Uh, can be quite annoying for the people to take a bit to get going in the morning, but uh, it's quite a positive if you live out here in the bush and you wake up early every day. Around. Lovely tea. Nice warm tea for a cold morning. But as I said, it's not particularly cold. Rather wet. Well, Aaron would like to know what kind of tea I'm drinking. Uh, well, Aaron, good old stock standard English breakfast. Uh, yesterday I did have Earl Grey there. Felt like a bit of a change. But I have... Uh, English breakfast in the, in the true African tradition. Lots of milk and lots of sugar. Oh, it's looking promising if we look to the east. The clouds are breaking up quite nicely. See there. And you notice how yellow the sunrise is looking as opposed to the deep reds we've been experiencing. Now that is definitely from this little spattering of rain we've had. So when you get those really red sunrises and really red sunsets, it's generally because there's a lot of dust in the air. And of course this, this little spattering of rain would have settled the dust. And you see it's very yellow in comparison to what it was yesterday morning, for example. So Rachel's wondering that little spattering of rain we had, will it actually help anything grow at this time of year? Unfortunately, not really, Rachel. Uh, really just sort of settles the dust. A lion track. Oh dear. Naughty lion. Why are you going that way? Is that a lion in the road, Dave? Mm, I don't think so. Let's have a little zoom onto that there. What is that in the road? Dave doesn't think it's a lion. I think he might be correct. No, it is a leopard. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> the leopard dart is over! It looks... Who is that? Oh, she's just noted us. It could be Queen Karula. Let's go have a look. Well done, Dave. I thought it wasn't a cat. I thought you thought it was the bush, didn't you? And she's drinking out of the puddle in the road. Leopard drought over! Just hope that leopard keeps going that way. It doesn't go that way. Is this a slightly damp queen cooler we're looking at? I think it might be. I'm just going to have a quick look from here. It is a very wet queen cooler. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Having a little drink out of the puddle. Get a bit closer. 
I always, when I first see a leopard long distance, if I'm not sure who it is, I always stop a little bit further away because you never know when you might encounter an unrelaxed animal and you can't just move you on up to like we do to a lot of our leopards here. Yeah? And also, just in case the cubs were close by, I wanted to stop a little bit further. Can't see any sign of them just yet. I get you in a good spot to see her drinking. How's that, Dave? Lovely. And you can see she's a little bit damp, and it's almost got like a dark racing stripe where she's got more wet down the middle of her back, if you notice there, and on her head. Move to the next puddle, it's a bit bigger. Oh, well, there we go. At least the leopard drought has ended. And who better to end the drought than the queen of Juma? Oh, wet feet. I love it when leopards do that. There we go, Queen Karula. Now, oh, hopefully, she's heading back to some baby Karulas. And if anyone's wondering why we get up so early in the morning, that's the reason to catch the cats on the move. Now, what's amazing is because of the rain, it actually hardens the soil. We would not have even seen her tracks in the low light. And they'd be very like, near impossible to see at the moment. So the rain actually doesn't make tracking easier, it makes it more difficult. Now everyone, we're wishing her to go that way, that way, Karula, that way, into Juma, not to the south. Oh, she spotted some impala down the road. Crossing, there we go, you can see them pile in the distance. And off she goes to stalk now. It's on the wrong side of the road, and pile and go that way. <laughs> so we might lose visual of her while she's stalking, but it'll be worth our while sitting down at the bottom of the hill. Let's see if we can spot her through here. She just jogged into here. You see her, Dad? Mm -hmm. Karula can move quite quickly. I've seen her do it before. So she could already be this far. Gone, madame. The impala just up ahead there. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to pull off the road here. And I'm afraid we're going to have to play the waiting game now. It's 
unfortunately, she has gone to the south of us. Just keep looking into the bush here. What I'm looking for is I'm trying to see that little white flick of the tail. southern side of the road and we're gonna have to play the patience game now we're just gonna have to sit here quietly and listen because we can't see what's going on it's quite thick there but I'm very confident she's moving down around trying to go around the impala she does grab one we're just gonna hope she pulls it this way very carefully. There's a young male in parlor there. Now oh, leopard stalks can sometimes take an hour. She did look like she was quite hungry. So the pilot looked quite relaxed. They didn't spot her all the way up the road. What I am hoping is I get a sight of her as she's coming down. sitting here for quite a while just listening to see what happens there's always that possibility that she might come back across she might get spotted so the last place we saw it was just about about there and she jogged in so I'm guessing she's gonna go like this if she doesn't go further south to even try to come around the Impala, we might get a visual of her somewhere in front of us here. It's a good area for her to hunt, thick, thick bush. Now the Impalas will be a little bit damp. And the wet soil will mask the sound of her walking. She's got to make sure she doesn't bump into very wet trees that send all the little droplets shivering down. Yeah, white brown scub robin calling ahead of us. <whistles> noisy, 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 noisy. Judy H is wondering, do I think she stopped lactating? Her belly doesn't look as droopy. Um, it might have just been the angle, Judy. I, she does, I think she has stopped lactating. They normally stop lactating at about three months, when the cubs are about three months old. 
But with her droopy belly, I'm afraid it's going to be droopy for the rest of her life. And she does have quite a droopy belly, but she has had a lot of cubs over the years. And uh, it's quite a prominent feature in all the leopards. So what I'm also listening for is any little bird that might spot her might also give an alarm call. I think I hear something walking just in here. Could be my imagination though. We have the Franklins going bananas. That's the dawn chorus. They're just waking up and shouting all the Franklins saying, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, look at that beautiful colour on that cloud, Dave. Hmm. Very, very subtle salmon pink, I think it would be called. Oh, that is a cumulus cloud. That's one of the nasty clouds that's bringing rain. It's one of those, those things, and I know a lot of our old viewers will know. One of my things is that the best weapon in your arsenal of awesome sightings is patience. Quite often you spend a lot of time sitting and waiting for something to happen, but it's worth it. But what a way to start yucking away about the dark, the weather, the rain, and oh, a leopard in the road. Don't often make it that easy for us. Just listening. Some pile of making a noise. I'm gonna go down the road a little bit. See. Some pile went in around here. There, there, footprints in the wet ground. They seem to move quite quickly in, which is not good for us, I'm afraid. Here we go. Now see them, they've moved out to the open. It's very clever if you're the impala. Gives you less of a chance of a leopard being able to sneak up on you. So there we go, there's an impala there. But there are a bunch of boys, so they might get silly and start chasing each other about. And that's exactly the type of opportunity Karula will be waiting for. So Nigel is wondering. Do the cats have tactics? Yes, they do, Nigel, but not nearly as, as complicated and as clever as you would think. Um, ambush predators basically try get within five meters and then pounce. And if you're spotted, walk away. A nice little bachelor group of impala. Even though Karula is quite capable of taking down a big adult male, she'd prefer to take down a smaller one. That gives her the opportunity to be able to hoist. 
Who you guys seen? But we're gonna keep waiting here to see what's cracking with Karula and Mempala. While we do that, let's say good morning to the winter farmer on foot. How lucky are you this morning to have Karula all to yourselves and uh, leaving myself and Jandre busy wondering about wet toes and whether or not it's going to be raining on us anytime soon. Good morning, I'm Stefan Winterboer and Jandre is on camera with us on the bushwalk for today. And right off the bat, something quite interesting is happening over here with these termite mounds. That's what Jandre opened on for you. It wasn't just these arbitrary piles of sand, it's actually it looks to me like something has been opening up these, these, uh, these chimneys and, and it's giving us a unique insight into what these chimneys actually look like. There you can see inside, that's actually constructed like that, can you believe it? It's constructed with a hole in it. The reason for that is that these termites build the world's, well I said biggest natural air conditioners. These are farming termites and they farm fungus. And one of the ways that you farm fungus is to control temperature and humidity very, very well. And that's exactly what this design does. It keeps the temperature inside a termite mound to between 30, it's 29 and 31 degrees centigrade is the average temperature. Doesn't matter what's happening to the season, doesn't matter what's happening with the rain, they keep a constant temperature and humidity in there. And this has now been chopped open probably by a honey badger to be quite honest with you. Honey badgers or an aardvark or a pangolin will come and scrape open the termitaria which elicits an immediate response from the soldier termites and they come rushing out and of course a pangolin or, a, or an aardvark would then just lap up the termites at liberty until the termites realize that they're being attacked by a foe that they can't get away from and, uh, and will eventually disappear. <clears throat> It's quite nice, this whole termitarium has been opened a little bit and you can actually see a chamber over there. So that's now a chamber that sits below a, there's the chamber there, and it sits below the chimney there. This is now the chamber. Now that is a collection point for hot air. That collection point, and it's where all the termites will gather, and then the hot air escapes out of that chimney, and that is... It's actually, you can feel it, not today, they've closed off that chimney over there, obviously with it being damaged. Soldiers rushed in there, chased away the attacker. In this particular case, I think because it was an aardvark or a pangolin, they would have retracted, sealed off the tunnel, and now they'll come out at some point and they'll come and repair the damage. And uh, that's how they do it. And termites, they being, well, they get eaten by nearly everything over here. It's an incredibly good source of protein. And by protein, insect protein, I mean, it's probably about, well, let me give you an ratio. 100 grams of, okay, excuse that, that was a piece of wet bark that fell off the tree in the distance over there and gave Jandre and I a bit of a fright. It sounded like something was running through the bush, so excuse me flashing my bald, the back of my bald head at you over there through the camera, but uh, that, uh, it's definitely a cause for some concern when unexpected noises happen here in the bush. Anyway, back to my point. 100 grams of, of protein, insect protein, is equal to 300 grams of beef protein. How's that for a, for a nice little bit of... Uh, that's just... I'm looking for the inhabitant of that. There's spiders that live in these little silk cocoons and these grass spiders at the moment that have got the most unbelievable colors on their abdomen. Um, so. Insect protein, very, very good for animals to utilize. And in some instances, birds migrate all the way from tropical climates. Our violet back starlings come from tropical climates, Central Africa, all the way here to escape the rain in the, in the, in the rainforests. Step eagles, um, what other birds come all the way from the far eastern sides of Russia? I mean, like, there are a few, but right now, oh, moor falcons and step eagles are probably the furthest visitors that we get. They come all the way from Russia, from the eastern side of Russia, down to South Africa to come and feed on termites that we have over here. So, you know, very good. And then the termites, obviously, knowing that they get eaten like that, have their various defenses. And... Uh, now the fact that there's no termite, termites present over there was testimony to the fact that they probably 
still recovering from that last attack. I'm keeping my head on a bit of a swivel. We're around the Juma Vuyatela pan at the moment. And as you, for those of you who keep an eye on our Juma dam cam will notice, there are lots of buffalo that enjoy that pan. They usually come out of the bushes in this particular place uh, towards the heat of the day. And you can see them lying up in the pan. Now, we don't have any buffalo there, but there will be somewhere. Now, John and I are definitely going to get wet feet today. The little bit of rain that we had um, is just enough to wet the grass. We'll give us squelchy shoes, and that's about that. Don't get rid of the dust, which is also a good thing. Incidentally, we can see how many millimeters of rain we had. So while there's a prediction for, let's say, three millimeters or five millimeters or one millimeter of rain, the best way to see it is you actually just scratch open the sand until you get dry sand. And you can see there's some dry sand there. And the difference between the ground level and where you start to get dry sand is how many millimeters of rain we've had. In this particular case, I don't even think we've had one millimeter of rain. So that's how we can say the reality versus the predicted rainfall for an area. And this particular area, we normally get about 450 to 600 millimeters of rain per year. On an incredibly wet year, it's not uncommon for rain to go above 1,000 millimeters. In some cases, 2012, we, th we had 1,400 millimeters of rain here. Before that, it was the year 2000. The year 2000, just watch out behind you there, jean -Louis. In the year 2000, we had 1,650 millimeters of rain. Um, so probably four or five times what our normal average rainfall is. So here we have some birds. Now birds operate within a very, very strict weight range. Ah, all right. <laughs> so what happens on a, on a night like last night, where it's rainy and it's a bit cold and there's been a cold front that's passed over and these birds start to shiver to stay warm. They're warm-blooded. They start to shiver to stay, to stay warm. They can actually dip below the weight or they can dip below an optimal weight. In other words, they can use up so much energy that the next morning they don't have enough energy to fly away or to hunt. In this particular case, of course, that was immediately dispelled by the birds flying away the instant I wanted to show them to you. But such happens around me. Right, so no buffalo at the pan. Today we are going to be walking east. Ah, oh, have a look at that, John. Eh? And the reason for that is none other than jean -Ray choosing to walk east today. We had a very sophisticated voting system. Herbert, myself and jean -Ray decided where we'd go at basically the answer to a question. Now what you're having a look over there is the tail end of this cold front that passed us last night. So the cold front will push some warm air in front of it. As the warm air rises over the cold front, it then Deliver, it drops its moisture that it has and that's exactly what's happened now. What you're looking at there is clouds that are pushing in from our southeast and the sun just trying to crest over a bank of clouds that's sitting above the Lobombo mountain range or the eastern end of the low felt. The low felt which is where we are at the moment or the low bush is an area that is lower than the two mountain ranges which flank us on the western side, the Drakensberg mountain range. On the eastern side, we have got the Lobombo mountain range. And between them is a depression called the Low Felt or the Low Bush. And that's where we are. That's where the Kruger National Park is situated in this depression between the two mountain ranges. That bank of clouds that you can see there marks the, um, marks two things in actual fact. It marks the eastern edge of the Kruger National Park but it also marks the most southerly point of the African Rift Valley. The African Rift Valley, um, if you've been a natural history follower for your entire life, you would have known that a lot of documentaries have been done on the Africa Rift Valley. It's home to none other than Lake Malawi, 
or Lake Tanganyika, one of the deepest freshwater lakes in the world. It's home to the Luangwa National Park, one of the most diverse animal places or animal refuges left to us. What else is it's home to, uh, Jandre? Uh, the Rift Valley. Probably a bunch of people, it was one of the migration routes from Central Africa down to South Africa or down to Southern Africa, I should say, of people that are today um, the ancestors of the Zulu people or the Nguni-speaking tribes, at least anyway, that came down into Southern Africa a couple of thousand years ago. All right. Now on a wet day like today, not much surface water. The surface water would have been sucked up. The surface water would have been Zondre just picking up some um, travelers on his boot. Not much surface water would have been left. As far as I understand, you're watching Karula um, busy drinking out of a puddle on the road. And that puddle will disappear quite quickly. It's very thirsty, the bush here at the moment. And unless there's some clay lying in a depression, I don't think that one or two millimeters of rain are going to do much at all. To, to leaving puddles at least in the bush. <laughs> All right. I just want to say thank you, Siberia Zumi. You say that uh, you've just spotted us walking across the open area by the Juma Dam Cam, and uh, and with the aerial on the back of uh, Jandre's back, you mistook us for a giraffe. That's solely down to the fact that Jandre is about as tall as a giraffe, and then he's still got this massive aerial on his backpack. But with that, we're going to send you back through to Brent, who's got an update on Karula for you. So unfortunately, Queen Karula headed deeper south into the Lugari, so we had to leave the area. But look at this. Isn't this just the cutest little fluffy creature that we've seen in a while? Baby waterbuck are so fluffy. And following a mom, who's got that nice big white circle on her bottom for the little one to follow. So the white ring on a waterbuck's bottom is a following mechanism specifically for the young to be able to follow the adults. You can see how they're all puffed up uh, even more so than usual after the rain. You can see a little bit of damp. So even though it's not that cold this morning, the animals being a little bit damp will be puffed up to try warm themselves. Nice little little herd of waterbuck here on Cheetah Cut Line. They stop and listen before they move into a slightly thicker area, making sure there's no potential predators up ahead. Now the actual emblem for the Sabi Sands Game Reserve is a big male waterbuck. And the first warden, Harry Kirkman, uh, chose that emblem because around his house, which is down in the center of the Sabi Sands, or sorry, down to sort of the southeast of the Sabi Sands, uh, there was a, he used to see a lot of waterbuck all around his house. So uh, he decided that that big male waterbuck should be the emblem of the Sabi Sands Viltain. And that's what it used to be called. The Sabi Sands Viltain. Viltain basically translates to wild garden in Afrikaans. So game reserve, a wild garden. So while we continue on, along the eastern boundary. Uh, I'm hoping for some lion tracks. I have heard they found lions to the south of us, just outside of our 
Travis area, but the lines have been all over the place. Ooh, look at that. Now, here's one to get our birders going this morning. Quickly, quickly, it's gonna fly, it's gonna fly. Oh, it looked like he was about to take off. Now, there's an interesting bird. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Ha ha! Now, there's a good one to get the bird is thinking. I'm going to try to reposition so we can get a view of him in that tree. Lovely golden light coming through. Yeah, I think that's going to be about the best we're going to get, unfortunately. He's gone right into a thicket. There he is. You can see all wet. And what it was doing when we first spotted him was drying out, opening those wings. We're going to be very thankful when the sun eventually breaks through to help in the drying process. You can see how it's drooping its wings down, and opening them up to try and dry out. Now, this could be quite a tricky bird. It is one we've seen before. Let's see who can figure out what bird this is. If you think you know what bird this is, pop me an email and questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Not the easiest one to identify this morning, but I think you guys need a challenge to get the grey matter going. There we go, moving. Have a better look. Now remember to always look at the legs and make sure that there's let me just roll back a little bit. I'm trying to see if we're going to get a better view from behind. You think so, Dave? Uh, yeah, maybe there. Yeah. There we go. Now we can see it a bit more clearly. It's sitting, facing the wind, trying to dry out. Look at those talons. Oh, that's a one-legged bird now, so I'll tuck that other leg up there. Open wings using the wind to help dry out from the weather. <coughs> now, as it flew, you would have noticed what looks like little windows in the wing, and that's a, a little hint to you guys, a little diagnostic feature that you must look out for when trying to identify this particular bird. <laughs> Looking decidedly uncomfortable with life. I think this is going to catch you out. Well, you guys ponder what bird that is. We're going to keep moving. I'm sure you've got enough screenshots and whatnot to try and make your identification now. Let's go see what else we can find here on the eastern front of a Juma private game reserve. So the first answer is in already, a uh, tawny eagle. It's not. So that's why I said this is going to be quite tricky. It's, it's not an easy one to identify um, because sometimes 
may look a little different. Now let's see if that hint helps anyone out there. Maybe it's not a big one. making that noise. Look, there we go. That's not the bird that's making the noise, but there's a starling, and it looks like he's got a nest in that hole. Now we're finding birds nesting a little bit later than usual, and probably because there's been a lack of food for the majority of the summer months. Yeah, Dave's found you a false marula to the left there, and you can see how the leaves are starting to turn. Go up now, Dave. That's, there we go. There we go, the false marula. You can see the yellow coming through as we head through to winter, and soon there'll probably be no leaves on that particular tree. Now, this is the first morning in about five days. We have not been inundated with roaring lions, which is a bit of a pity. I quite enjoy waking up to the cacophony of male lions proclaiming their land. That doesn't mean there aren't any lions around. So we are gonna check carefully and uh, update on those cheetah from last night. Ephraim has gone to have a look He's going to let me know if they are are there. We'll dash down to the east. So we've got a few more answers for that a bird of prey we've just seen. A step eagle, unfortunately not. They've already left the area. They've migrated back north, back to the steppes of Russia and Mongolia. And another answer come through, a, a martial eagle. Too small for a martial eagle, I'm afraid. I told you I think I might have you guys this morning. hawk? No, not either. Remember there was feather all the way down to the feet, which means it's a true eagle, an aquila eagle. A harrier hawk would have a bare leg, a bright yellow bare leg, so not a harrier hawk. Well, it seems like you guys are getting a bit rusty on the birds. Maybe we should have a bird morning after. I mean, we've got the leopard done, you know, moving on. Uh, maybe we should, while we look for lions, do a bit of bird watching this morning and uh, see what we can find. Down the road, no, nothing there. It looks like it's building to become a very nice day. And uh, clearing nicely. So while we continue in search of big cats and birds, let's go see what Stefan's up to on foot. Brent, the, the, the ever optimist for the big cats. I must say, he's definitely got the drive that is needed to find these big cats for you. We're just having a meander through 
Oh, well, we're having a meander on the edge of this drainage line here and just having a look, what's striking about this particular place is having a look at the apparent devastation that elephants cause. Now, right where we are now, you can see that this knobthorn, this young knobthorn has been pushed over. But in the background, as you have a look up, you'll just see that there's successive generations of trees that have been knocked over and pushed around and broken. And there's this raging debate, it's been going on for years, as to whether or not um, there's too many elephants in the Kruger National Park and whether or not conservation efforts over the last couple of decades coupled with the decreasing area that elephants get to, uh, get to roam around in is having a negative effect on the bush um, and in, in actual fact having a detrimental effect on the bush. In other words, reducing the ability of the bush that is left or the wilderness areas that are left to sustain the biodiversity that we need going forward and it's a it's a massive debate that's got heat, people in heated arguments all over the world i don't know I, you know i think if we had to decide which one's best or which one's not best it would be a difficult thing for me to do i personally i like to weigh up my views weigh up the options on both and just you know take a bit of a step back i definitely realize that i'm not the cleverest person on the face of the planet and that my views quite often mean absolutely nothing but um, here are the two sides as I understand it the one is is that elephants are in such a reduced number excuse me there was just a purple roller I'll catch that up with you now so this is a bird and I'm going to add it to Brent's bird list for today that bird that we've got at the top there is definitely nothing one that we don't see that common and we're going to add it to those of you who are keeping a bird tally that's a purple roller now, color's not that good because we've got those light clouds at the back there, but definitely for those of you who are wanting to do a screen grab, the head markings and the robust nature of that bird is what's giving me its general impression of size and shape. The fact that it doesn't have any tail streamers, you can see that that's quite evident on the fact that there's no tail streamers that the lilac breasted roller has. And European rollers, which it could be confused with at the moment, are not that big. Now, I know it's quite difficult to judge size here with this particular one. Oh, there we go. And he's flown off. So that was a purple roller. For those of you who are keeping the, the bird counts going, purple roller. Now back to the, this debate or this, this raging uh, debate around around too many elephant, too few elephant, what should we do? Should they move elephant into other areas? Shouldn't they do it? Um, I would say that elephant are in such reduced numbers currently that we don't actually know what effect, what negative effect they can have on the bush. The other side of the scale is that, or the other side of the story is that, um, is that uh, we are charged with protecting biodiversity and if there's a clear indication that animals are threatening that biodiversity then we should do something to conserve it and there's evidence for both sides there's evidence to say that elephant know exactly what they're doing that they're mother nature's engineers they terraform at a macro level um, and that we should just leave them as is the case with Amboseli National Park where they left the elephant numbers to do what they wanted to do and they stabilized over time People are often using Chobe National Park as, a, as, a, as an example. The Chobe National Park is enormous. It's, it's one of Africa's largest parks. And the unfortunate thing is that the elephants congregate very close to a little town called Kasani. They congregate there in the dry season and they're having a massive effect on the local bush, on the local biodiversity. There's probably about 80,000 elephant that occur and probably about a 50 or 60 kilometer stretch of river there, now, just those numbers. So 50 or 60 miles of river, we'll use miles because I don't exactly know exactly how many kilometers it is, but it's around about that. And then there are 80 to 90,000 elephant that go to the water and come back and go to the water every day. And they're having a dramatic effect on the bush there. So people are using those two arguments. They're saying, well, if we leave it and it goes Amboseli's way, What's to say that it's not going to go the Chobe National Parkway and have such a massive effect on the biodiversity of the Kruger Park? And to be honest, the biodiversity in the Kruger National Park is higher than any of the other national parks I've ever visited myself. It's one of the key features of the Kruger National Park is its biodiversity. 
There's a big stump behind you, Jean-Dre. Sorry, jean is walking backwards while he's filming me. He does it in the most athletic way possible, but he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head. He uses me for that. I have to tell him every now and again. <laughs> so Red's just noticed that obviously with me walking into the camera, jean has to be walking backwards. And no, he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head or a rear view mirror. He does this with his feet. Let me show you. So while he's busy filming like this, he will be walking like this with his feet, trying his best not to trip over all of these obstacles and then trusting me implicitly to let him know when he was going to get himself into trouble. Look, I keep it in reserve tank that I don't have to tell him these things and that he's at, it's at my discretion that he doesn't fall on his back. <laughs> all right, I just want to share this big tree with you. It's a jackalberry tree and a very majestic example of a jackalberry tree. It's just a piece around big trees like this. For those of you who watched yesterday, I gave a big, uh, a big tree a hug. Um, can't even remember what species it was right now. It was only 24 hours ago. My short-term memory is going crazy. But anyway, it was a very big tree. And I, I very rarely do I pass big trees like this without taking some note of it. And this is a prime example of a jackalberry tree. One of the tallest trees that we find in the Kruger National Park. They get to about 25 meters tall. The tallest tree in the Kruger National Park is actually a Matumi tree. But we don't have too many Matumis over here. The closest I've seen a Matumi to where we're standing right now is close to the Sabi River, about 40 kilometers away. But the, the, the tallest trees in Matumi, they grow five meters taller than this one. This particular tree is probably in the region of about 22, 20 meters tall. And an absolutely enormous tree. They call it the African ebony. One of the other common names for it is the African ebony. And that is because the inside or the heartwood of this tree is this rich, dark, dark color. Beautiful, eh? Anyway. Let's Let's carry on. Justin has asked me a nice question about what is the hardest animal to track in the bush. Um, Justin, it's, if we just stick to, and we don't bring in everything into the bush, if we just stick to the animals that we most commonly find out here, I think the, the hardest animal to find would be a leopard. Um, friends of mine who are gifted trackers, almost exclusively all, test themselves against finding leopard all the time. I think it would be more difficult to find a pangolin or to find an aardvark or to find a hedgehog or a striped polecat, but they're not difficult to track these animals. Leopard move relatively far distances quite quickly. They can also learn. And so when you're tracking a leopard, you're not just tracking an animal, you're tracking an individual that has the ability to learn and adapt. And they learn and adapt to their area. And I think it's at least anyway, the way I understand it from what they say, that's one of the challenges with being an advanced tracker is to try and pitch yourself against something that's got an intelligence. Now, there's a big hole there, Jean-Dre. Now, when, um, when you talk about what's the most difficult animal to track in the bush in its entirety, okay, we've got some ox peckers that are that are busy calling and through the bush I'm just getting this this movement. Now I did spot the legs of a giraffe running off there in the distance. I think we disturbed it coming down into this drainage line busy talking as loud as what I was. But in any case let's see if we can go around and get a view of him. Now the most difficult animal I think to track in the bush all things considered, would probably be a person. Um, there's, a, ob there's a very obvious poaching um, element to the Kruger National Park at the moment. Everybody's well aware of rhino poaching reaching some of its highest levels since the 1980s. And some of my friends who are gifted trackers have gone into man tracking, have gone into the art of tracking man. And these trackers, some of the best of, in the world, are finding it so difficult to become man trackers and they reckon that it's some of the most fulfilling uh, tracking is to be able to put yourself against the intelligence of a human being. Now uh, I'm just getting 
these glimpses of these giraffe that are busy moving over in this direction over here. You can just hear them as well. Very difficult for me to share this with you because for you it's just a wall of green. For me, I'm hearing the oxpeckers, I'm almost feeling the feet of the giraffe as they're running across this, this wet earth. But we'll see if we can get a little bit closer without them running away. They're going to be so super alert at the moment, it will be tough, but nevertheless, we'll give it a bash. Oh, another two examples while we're waiting for the giraffe to calm down a little bit. We don't want to just keep on pushing them, we'll never get to see them. But we've just seen a massive jackalberry, and now I want to share with you two other trees that are in prime form. The one that on the left hand side, the one with the yellowy leaves, is a false marula. And the one on the left hand side is a tambuiti tree. Now, this tambuiti tree was injured as a very, very young sapling, right close to its base. And that's why you've got two trees growing right next to each other. When you chop a branch at a young age, a sapling, it almost always splits into two. So what's happened here is this tree was injured, probably by an unsuspecting animal just coming down moving on to these animal paths and as it grew up it split into two and then ended up branching into this absolutely beautiful tree. You can see why they were so highly prized for their, for their, for their timber. They are a protected tree in South Africa. You can't chop them down um, in, in any area without a license and very very strict restrictions are placed on the use of this tree but it's a beautiful example of a Tambuiti tree and then the one on the left is probably I'm gonna say it the largest lanier that I've ever seen the right. the, sorry excuse me the one on the right so I'm a, <laughs> yeah that's just me the one on the right hand side the very tall one with the yellowy leaves at the top is and I will say that right now the tallest lanier Schweinfurtii or false marula tree that I've ever seen in my time in the Sabi Sands very nice. And on that note, while we carry on exploring for these giraffe and while we carry on looking for these giant examples of trees, we're going to send you through to Brent, so I'm sure he's got an update for you. So, the weather has changed considerably since you left us and we actually got some rain. And I'm going to turn around now, have a look, and you can actually see the rain coming in across to the south and see how the clouds have built and you can just see the rain coming through there so we're heading north away from it trying to run away from the rain but um, unfortunately it will catch up with us at some point hopefully we are going to be dry enough to continue so we're just zigzagging between uh, Drakensberg Road and our eastern boundary, Chile Cut Line, seeing if we can find any tracks. We head back towards a Chile Cut Line now. There's, it's like a breeding herd of buffalo passed through here last night. Now, oh, the one thing that lions love is a good buffalo herd. So hopefully we can find some lion tracks behind it. Oh, quite a big herd. It seems like they're heading towards Buffalo's Hook. So we'll do the same. And slowly keep zigzagging our way towards the Buffalo's Hook water hole. Here we go. Another bird for this morning's bird list, an emerald spotted wood dove. And you can see those lovely little emerald spots on its wings. And when the light catches them, they just sparkle. Very cute little bird. But a very well, a big well done to Diane, jo Diane, Joanne and Bev, who um, got that Raptor, correct. It was indeed a juvenile African hawk eagle. Here we go. So there's the adult and there's the juvenile which we saw this morning. A juvenile African hawk eagle. 
Well done, guys. It wasn't an easy bird at all. So that's, that herd of buffalo came through here. I'm just going to go check if there are possibly any lion tracks behind it. Now, that Inkahuma lioness who's got the cubs is direct line from here, about a kilometre and a half, so not too far. So this would definitely fall within her sort of hunting radius while she's there. sign of any tracks unfortunately. Uh, Dave just wiping away some of the rain spots off the lens. Maybe I'll be lucky enough to catch up with that herd of buffalo. So Dina's wondering, is there any updates on Shano and her cub? Uh, so not yet, Dina. Uh, I haven't heard anything. I don't think anyone's seen her for quite a while. But um, as soon as we do get an update, I will let you know. So we're coming up just ahead to uh, the junction of Hippo Pools Road. Cheetah cut down, and for some reason, that is a sort of major highway for the cats in and out, both leopard and lion. So, always check carefully around there. Now, we've got to look a little bit more carefully because of that little bit of rain this morning. And we're not only looking for tracks on top of the rain, we're looking for tracks under it as well. Before we get there, I'm already starting to check carefully. Just a hippo I was walking before the rain, tracks I can see. Doesn't look like anyone was using the highway apart from the hippo last night. Look how absolutely gorgeous when the sun breaks through this cloud, the light is. And unfortunately, the rain is coming from that direction. Just a slight little drizzle at the moment. such a different smell after the rain. So yesterday I was talking about that dusty, dry season smell. Now after even just the tiniest sprinkling of rain, that sort of dusty smell is gone. And it's quite a fresh, a fresh smell. I wouldn't call it fragrant, but uh, it's, it's just a good, it sort of smells clean. Although it's probably not, but nevertheless, it just, it smells fresh and clean this morning. Have a look at the top of that dead tree. I think it's just a funny colored, uh, to the left dead tree. Sorry, there's a few there, that was my fault there. Yeah, I looked, I thought I saw something go into that top of that tree, but nothing there. Could have been a squirrel or a bird. It looks like there is a hollow there. So 
this road leads right to the Buffalo Hook. Oh, sorry, let me rearrange my seat there. Right to the Buffalo Hook waterhole. And we're going to go have a quick squiz around there before heading further uh, to the west and checking the boundary to around Sydney's dam. That's where the Nkumas were last, but further to the north of there. But what, what a bit of luck we had this morning with Queen Karula. And uh, we had lion tracks coming out there. I just saw something slightly cat-like in the road up ahead. Dave thought it was a bush, of course. Didn't you, Dave? Yes, I did. Yes. Um, but yeah, very, and awesome to see her drinking out of that little puddle in the road. And hopefully she had, has some luck with those impala. But they went further to the south, so she followed them. Well, just to keep the bird list ticking over, and one of our more common species, and another um, part of the same family as the little emerald spotted wood dove we just saw. There we go, a Cape turtle dove. I'm very aware. You can see that little black ring around its neck. You can see how fast the clouds are moving behind it. But so far, we are out running the rain. There you go, Cape Turtle Dub for this morning's bird list. So we are about to arrive at the Buffalshook Waterhole. So we'll have a quick look there and see what's around no tracks just yet fingers crossed male lion sleeping at the waterhole what do you reckon Dave? I reckon we got it. Well, you reckon we got it? Yeah. Dave's a little bit more confident than me, but we will think positively that there's a lion at the water hole. Don't mind if it's male or female, to be honest. There we go. So we come down towards the water hole. Not looking promising. And there is the hippo. So the lonely hippo of Buffalo's Hook Waterhole. There he is. This morning, without lions. Just the male hippo. He's, I'm sure, happy for the cool weather and the little bit of rain. While we leave the hippo to doze on in the waterhole, let's go have a look at Steph, who's got some incredible trees to show you. What we're showing you here, we found this almost magical grove of big hardwood trees and this is one of my favorite of them. This is a jacket plum tree. Jacket plum, um, or as it's commonly known in this particular area as the indaba tree. 
And the reason why they call it an indaba tree is the fact that this tree, not this particular one because it's enormous, but the, 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 they quite often grow in a canopy. And underneath the canopy, because it's such a dense lot of shade, nothing else grows. And indaba is one of an Af well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an African name for a meeting, a meeting of elders usually. And it usually happens underneath these trees. And because, not for any magical or spiritual significance, but because the trees provide a nice little bit of shade in the middle of the day, usually in a low canopy, low enough to put your, tree, your chair under and then for you to sit. Some other interesting facts about this tree is that it's the closest relative that South Africa has to the Chinese lychee tree. Now lychees or lychees as we commonly refer to them or you know common in the supermarket. This particular tree also produces a very edible fruit. This particular tree produces a fruit that you can not only eat but you can also make quite a potent um, I want to say almost moonshine from, you can make quite a potent local liquor from this. And Herbert was busy telling me the other day, quite fondly, that as a naughty little boy, him and his friends used to hide gourds of this local homemade brew out in the forest. And then when no one was looking or they, they, were, uh, they were looking after their, for attending their father's herds, they used to go and have a little bit of a party uh, when they found the tree. So from this, quite a nice story from, from Herbert. And in this little grove, you can see down here, this grove of Tambuti trees. Now, Tambuti thicket forest is the rarest forest type that South Africa has. And we're standing in one of these little thickets at the moment. So quite a magical place to be in actual fact. The reason why they're so rare is that the Tambuti wood is incredibly valuable on the hardwood market. And um, unfortunately, most of the Tambuti thickets were chopped out uh, in early years before legislation came in to protect these trees. Now South Africa has probably a list of about 50 or 60 protected trees of which about 12 occur in the Kruger National Park. That Tambuti tree is one of them. And we're still in the same thicket. We're still walking into the thicket at the moment and you'll notice that almost all of the tall trees around me, all the trees that are of a medium height, are of the Tambuti. Ah, here we've got someone that's Hasn't come out to play, but definitely is enjoying, I think, a little bit of the wetter weather. That is a hinged tortoise and a youngster at that, quite nervously just keeping his covered. Now, they will be going into a dormancy period quite soon. And they don't hibernate. Um, there are very few animals in South Africa that hibernate, but what they will do is they'll go into a dormancy phase during the coldest times of the year and when there's not that much vegetation or water around. It benefits a cold-blooded animal like this to go into a type of um, reduced metabolic, metabolic rate. We call it dormancy. In an advanced stage in polar bears, for instance, it's even a sleep, or some of your bear species in your colder climates, it's even an advanced sleep, a very death-like sleep. But these tortoises just go into an inactivity period, they save what reserves they can, and as soon as it starts getting wetter, and as soon as vegetation comes out again, they'll come out, and we'll start seeing them a bit more frequently. Oh, these areas are just absolutely fantastic. I want to see if I can show you, there's a dead Tambuti, well not dead, but there's a dead bow on this Tambuti. <laughs> Anna Marie has asked me if I can find her a centipede or, an, or a baboon spider. Anna Marie, I'll try my best to try and do that for you. In the meantime, I want to try and see if I can show you why this particular uh, hardwood, the Tambuti wood, is so valued on the, on the hardwood market. I'm going to just take my, my knife and I'm going to, without chopping my fingers off, try and expose... some of the patterns in this wood. So that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm just busy shaving off the weathered piece of this tree. And I'm going to try and open up enough of the grain so that you can actually see how beautiful this wood is actually. Come and have a look there, Jean-Dé. 
quite close up you can see a very very hard wood tree and then if I polish it up you can actually see the grain of the wood very finely textured beautiful chocolate and brown colors on that wood and with the most unbelievable smell <sighs> it's called the African cedar and for good reason the wood is very pleasantly fragranced now for me I've made some clothes rails out of discarded pieces of these woods before for my room and this the smell while initially quite pleasant soon becomes quite sickening and the reason for that is the the, the 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 smell is made from a latex that occurs in this tree and that essential oil is actually quite poisonous and can actually make you quite sick fires made from this particular wood uh, quite often result in very runny tummies and tummy cramps and nausea but isn't that beautiful have a look at that wood inside there now that I'm busy polishing it up with my finger you can actually see how fantastic that is a little bit difficult to see in this light I know but anyway the Tambweti or African cedar very very hard very valuable very nice and we're standing in a nice thicket of them at the moment wandering through here what a pleasure that's what these bushwalks give us the ability to go to places that we wouldn't be able to get to in a car and explore them as we would like this is probably one of the biggest Tambuti thickets that I've ever walked in actually it extends probably about 100 or 200 meters in front of me and is probably about 50 meters wide or so and has a lot of adult trees in it so this was I wonder what happened over here have a look at this very funny this tree has been this is a young Tambuti and this tree has been damaged its bark has been damaged by something that looks like it was chewing on it now it smells quite weird doesn't smell very fresh but I'm judging from the the breakages that we see here you can see that this guari has been snapped you can see there this guari has been snapped and this tree has been mangled and I'm gonna make a judgment here without seeing any tracks I think a buffalo has put his horn at the tree and has rubbed his head up and down this tree so what a buffalo would have done is they get all these parasites that are that are all over there they underneath their horns and their ears and he would have stuck his horn on either side and he would have moved his head up and down he would have then been stuck into this branch his horn would have been stuck and he would have thrashed around a little bit and broken this bow off of this guari tree and that's exactly what I think has happened over here as a buffalo has come in scratched an itch on this young Tambuti tree got stuck on this quarry and snapped off this bow and that's what I think has happened right here if I were to read the story in the signs that are left for me here definitely no tracks here of any buffalo but that's what I think happened there that's the story so many animal paths here the Donna has just sent through some news or wanting me wanting me to confirm if I've actually heard of some news about a new type of tortoise that was caught in a fire somewhere I haven't Donna if you'd excuse me I don't get much news out here um, I haven't heard of that story at all but you're welcome if you want take a screen grab of the article or you can post it on our website I think you can or send it through send it through to, e to the email that we have we have an email called or use questions at wildearth.tv you can send it through there and we'll share the details on whatever social media we can be nice to share I didn't know about that at all but then I don't know about much that goes on in the real world to be quite honest <laughs> When we when we out here, we're quite remote from um, from from everything else, and uh, it's like a soap opera, you know. 
you touch base every few every 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 few weeks, and nothing really changes, and uh, and so you said no motivation for actually keeping current, but you do miss these little tidbits. In any case, Brent is standing by to give you an update on what he's been up to. I know he was at Bifflesock Dam, and I'm sure he's got another update for you. So, it's very, very, very strange weather we're having. It has now changed, it went warm, it got cold, it started raining, now it's cold again, and uh, very few animals about. So we're going to go check around Sydney's waterhole. So the Inkahuma lions were last seen in that general area. When I say general, very general, but to the north. So who knows, maybe they came south last night. And of course, quite difficult to see tracks after that little bit of rain. We're keeping away from the weather. It's coming from there. <laughs> We're being pushed into the top corner of Juma and hopefully the rain does stay away. And it's so strange, we've got this bright blue sky above us and, and then literally just clouds everywhere. Um, sorry about this. Andrew is just asking for an update. Morning, Andrew. No updates uh, from Vuatela. Uh, I've checked Chilakatla and Buffalo's Hook Dam and now uh, about to head towards Sydney's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the east just at the uh, Kobe, thanks very much. So, amazing pair of lions on Chitwa Chitwa, a herd of buffalo on Chit Plains, and an elephant bull somewhere yeah, in right. Torchwood. Torchwood. And speaking of elephants, wow. Naughty, naughty elephant has decided to block one of the main access roads. This is at the Buffalo Cut Line. And this elephant has pushed over a whole red bush willow. And Dave and I, even though we are wonderfully strapping and strong, are not going to try and move that one. It's a bit big. We're going to have to go round. So, Rachel is wondering why did the elephant create the Masai Mara and the Serengeti and they didn't flatten out the Kruger National Park? Um, Rachel, so it wasn't only elephants, elephants in tandem with weather uh, and cycles. So, firstly, the Mara and Serengeti has two rainy seasons. So, there's a lot more water there. So, grass prefers wetter climates. So there you have inundated areas that are too wet for, oh, sorry, dove, um, too wet for, for trees to grow in. So elephants help shape the ecosystem, they don't make it. And they do open certain areas on certain soil types. So certain areas of Kruger will be very open, uh, but an area like this, we, we on mostly quartzite soils, granite soils, and uh, it is generally going to be woodland. And if everywhere was grass, it wouldn't be that, that interesting, would it? So there's different areas and different, uh, the water table often has a lot to do with how open an area is, also the type of soil. And the elephants will definitely open up quite a lot of where we are this year uh, due to the droughts and during the lack of grass, they're going to be feeding on a lot more woody plants. So they will, will open it up to some degree, but never to the, the likes of the, the Serengeti or Mara. Also, they're on the equator, and the Mara is actually quite high, and Serengeti, but they're on the equator, so that the climate there is very different. So two rainy seasons, temperature varies very little during winter and summer, 
So there's lots of different reasons why why the Mara and Serengeti are like that and the, and the Kruger is like this. We're only 350 meters above sea level. We're generally a slightly arid climate. We only have one rainy season a year. But we've probably got more Mara elephants though than the Mara and Serengeti uh, at the moment. And, so, and that's more because we're part of a massive unfenced wilderness area uh, more than anything else. Okay, so we're about to arrive at our second waterhole of the day. Now, Dave, is there going to be a male lion at this one? Can only hope. We can only hope. We were so wrong about Buffalo's hook. So maybe we meant Sydney's. Da -da 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 -da. As we come around the corner to the open area around Sydney's waterhole, there's Waterbuck. And that's about it. Some nice male Waterbuck down towards the water's edge. But there we go, a little bachelor group, all males that I can see. Young males and a big male. And they look quite set. Nothing of the feline variety to disturb them. So, Jen B would like to know, is there someone we report that tree to? Um, or do we just keep driving around? Well, on a road like this, Jen, uh, that's used very often that'll be probably moved before this afternoon but on the smaller roads yes we do report big trees down uh, and then the guys will come with a tractor and pull it off the road so the only lion tracks we've seen this morning were unfortunately heading south off the juma but you never know, there might be one or two hiding in the middle. Where we haven't been today, so let's go look in the middle. Heading past Gauri Gate, uh, which is the entrance to the northern Sabi Sands. And uh, as we go past on the right, you'll see that's where Sabi Sands management resides. And as you can see, there goes a delivery truck from the gate. We're definitely not going to get caught behind that. As I said, we're going to search the middle of Juma now. At least we're not going to drive around and around and around looking for Krula because we know where she's gone. Maybe we should just drive down the cent center and western sectors and uh, who knows, maybe Shadow's come for a visit. Though we haven't seen her up the side for quite a while. So Kerry's wondering or asking, do leopards typically go far away from the cubs uh, when the cubs are at this age? They'll go far away from the cubs within days of the cubs being born, uh, Kerry. But they need to eat, so they'll stash the cubs in a safe place and they can move a big distance away from the cubs. Sorry, last station, go again.
Copy, thanks. Ah, they went there when we were there. There's three elephant bulls heading across to the cut line into Torchwood. Hopefully we'll be able to find some different eddies. One thing we have not been short on for the last while, but I wonder if the rain is going to change their behavior. Will it make them dissipate? I don't think so. I don't think there's been enough rain uh, to cause a massive change in behavior and the area that they're utilizing. towards Impala Plains and uh, I haven't forgotten about the birding but this cold windy weather is making it a little bit more difficult but I can hear a bird there it is I knew I heard one shouting away and uh, I'm just gonna pop it on camera keep the morning's bird list ticking over there we go a magpie shrike And they live in little flocks. Oh, off he goes. Just have a quick look. I think he might have caught something on the ground there, Dad. This way, there. there. Definitely popped off its perch. I don't know what you got there. Might have seen a little insect. They will grab little lizards and skinks and geckos as well. I think he's might be just eating some termites. Now, if it was lucky enough to see an eight-legged creature crawling out this time of the day, it would definitely pounce upon it. And Steph's got one of these eight-legged creatures to show you. So from a magpie eating something to the something that the magpie would like to eat. This is an olive thick-tailed scorpion or um, Europlectes oliviseus is its genus and species. For those of you who enjoy very dangerous things. And this little species of scorpion, this little Europlectes that you're seeing, you're actually looking at her, her abdomen. This is where her tail curls up over her back. Her body is pushed up into this little crevice. She was actually out drinking some moisture. And as we came past, we disturbed her. And she's, uh, she's crawled up into this, into her, it wouldn't be her home. They don't have homes. What she would have done is during the evening, she would have hunted into this pile of logs. And that's where she would have... That's exactly where she would have uh, stayed for the day. They're nocturnal. She hunts by aggressively or actively hunting all over this area over here, catching crickets and grasshoppers and um, poof, fish moths. She'll eat almost anything that she can find. Quite an aggressive little scorpion. These are most often the responsible party for scorpion stings out here. The olive thick-tailed scorpion. Very painful sting, not of medical importance, in other words it won't do anything to really harm you, but definitely very painful. Scorpions have venom that is keyed to a mammal pain receptor. In other words, it creates intense pain. So she has evolved over many hundreds of millions of years, and she's evolved that prey on her intense pain. Now I put her back up because that is exactly where we found her. We saw her go into that stump and when I turned over that piece of wood she was hiding inside there. So I'm just replacing her exactly where we found her. Just wanted to show you a little bit before we carried on going. So the olive thick-tailed scorpion of the insect predators out here probably akin to a leopard or a tiger. One of the big ones. Just bigger than her out here, we have the black hairy thick-tailed scorpion, the Parabuthus transvalicus. And for those of you who are close to your PCs at the moment, go and Google 
people go and look for a picture of Parabuthus transvalicus or the black hairy thick tailed scorpion and that definitely will give you a nightmare or two. They're the most dangerous scorpion that we find here and probably the second most dangerous scorpion that we find in South Africa. Now being quite a dry country we have a lot of scorpions not as much on the on this part of the country we're on the eastern side of the country as we do on the western side of the country on the western side of the country we have a lot more scorpions and there we have South Africa's most dangerous scorpion occurring on our west coast the Parabuthus granulatus or the granulated thick-tailed scorpion and that is South Africa's most dangerous scorpion absolutely capable of killing one of us or killing a human as is the black hairy thick-tailed scorpion but generally only for young children uh, people with heart conditions people that are allergic to that type of thing so that particular scorpion we've just had a look at right there he really can't do too much to us except cause much pain and discomfort let's go into this glade again Yeah, absolutely. I just had a request quickly from Zoom. Uh, you just wanted to know what that scorpion was called. The scorpion that we just had a look at over here was the Europlectes oliviceus, or the olive-tailed scorpion. Europlectes, U-R-O-P-L-E-C-T-E-S, I think. <laughs> and then oliviceus, and spelled exactly as you say it, oliviceus, or the olive-thick-tailed scorpion. I must say that this drainage line has been a never-ending series of delights. But we're quickly going to throw you over to Brent. We're having some signal problems. We're going to reboot and catch a bit. Right, it's one of those mornings where it seems to get colder and colder as we stay out. So uh, instead of de-layering, which we normally do at about this time in the morning, I'm re-layering. We're slowly working our way towards Impala Plains. I was hoping for at least some zebra or wildebeest around here, but nothing so yet. Maybe on the plains themselves. Ah, they are from Chile Impala up ahead. All fluffy this morning. bachelor group on the left. Hello boys. You can see some of them are colder than others and you can see the darker colouring on the ones that are really puffed up. Oh, they're all puffing up now as the wind gets a bit stronger. A little bit to the left there. There we go, those two having a little bit of a, a friendly horn lock. <laughs> Not very serious. Go. And there we go. To keep the bird list ticking along, there's a fork-tailed drongo fluttering around above them. And there we go. Looking for any insects disturbed as they walk around through the grass. And we can hear another one. Jet. There's that noisy down there. So, 
James Richard saying, I must imagine that night jars leave an impression or a track on the road. Have I ever seen it? I have, James. It's a very difficult track to see because being a bird, they're so light. And uh, night jars in particular are very, very light. So it is very difficult uh, to see that track. And you only ever really see it in very soft, soft soil. to find it. It sounded like a decent bird party here. And we're just trying to find them again. They might be up in this weeping wattle on the left. Ah, there's another bird for the morning's list. Oh, oh no, come back. Oh, there's a couple. Um, what have you got there? No, that one took off. Um, but if you go up, to the centre, uh, a little bit to the left. There. Oh, where are you up to now? It looked like a little cardinal woodpecker. I'm just going to see where it pops up. Where's the woodpecker gone? Ah, come down to the left. Uh, keep following that branch. Uh, up a little bit higher. Oh, he took off. Oh, no, he's been gone to the right now, <laughs> keeping Dave on his toes. But I don't think that's the woodpecker. Another bird flew off. The woodpecker's flown out. So there we go. In that little section there, if we zoom in, and a little bit lower. Oh, they're really jumping about. There, there we go. Oh, it was a crested barbet jumped through the the bush there. You got him. There. there we go. Well done. There we go. Little, very pretty bird, the crested barbet. They're not being very forgiving today. The crested barbet's flown off to that little weeping wattle there. Oh, quickly across the step with a centipede on the move. Well, we've got a surprise here. I've just put a cap of wood over a hunting centipede. We were requested quite nicely for a centipede. Oh no. Has she escaped us, Jean -Dre? There we go. There's your centipede. So the tail of the centipede is there. This is its tail. I don't know if it's a male or female. And it's all along there to the head, which is right there. I just put this cap of wood <laughs> over her. She, it was busy moving away from this pile of wood, hunting, obviously. And Herbert's very sharp eyes picked up the centipede. Now centi is hundred petty legs, so the hundred legs versus the millipede or the thousand legs. Now the most obvious difference is if you have a look at the centipede here you'll notice that rather than two pairs of legs on each segment you have only one pair of legs on each segment. Another quite obvious difference between a millipede and a centipede is those two tail feelers there and the centipede also has a modified pair of front legs a modified pair of front legs that sit underneath the head and have turned into basically poison glands and the modifi modified they, they've got fangs but the fangs are not modified teeth they're actually modified legs can you believe it and all centipedes have venom and they will use their venom to hunt their prey with and there's the other difference between a centipede and a millipede. The centipede is carnivorous, whereas millipedes are detritivores. They eat detritus. So there is your centipede. And I hope you've... I'm going to put this little guy back underneath this covering of wood just because we've exposed it. And we're going to leave it there for a little bit. 
and she will relax or he will relax and come out from that covering and carry on hunting. And the reason why they're hunting now and not at night time is because it's cloudy and it's cool and this is why they're out. Now, on that note, we're going to send you back to Brent. Well, keeping the bird just ticking over, there's an African grey hornbill doing a bit of morning preening. Very important for a bird to have all its feathers in the right place. As of course, very important for flight. You want to minimize the energy they use and, and that's why they preen and make sure everything's in the right spot. It's got a stick. <laughs> Almost looks like it was just playing with the stick. It was poking into it while it was preening, so I decided to remove it, give it a little bit of a juggle. A big, big job. And if we have a look carefully, when he turns, there we go, his head. See, there's a little ridge above the bill. Uh, that's called a cask. And it is a quite prominent in certain hornball species. And particularly the trumpeter hornball in this part of the world has a very visible large cask. This is quite, a, quite an amusing hornbill. Oh, off he goes. And we can still hear the magpie strikes making lots of noise. But up here, another one for the bird list. Some very cold and comfortable looking grey go away birds. Also doing their morning preen. But they look, they, they look like they're not enjoying this weather. They look quite miserable. And they, 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 all, they do sort of have that look about them that they're sort of quite a, quite a moany bird. Come here. Always obsessed about something. No, we haven't quite made it to the Impala Plains yet. And I'm going to keep checking for any other little interesting things we can see while, of course, looking for the big things as well. But sometimes it's quite nice to focus on the little things. Sorry, just this radio. Nothing new, just the same earlier. And aren't we lucky? It sounds like we were the only people to see Kula. So the guys to the south would haven't been able to find her yet. So James Richard has a request for LBJs. Since he's lacking quite a few of those on his list. An LBJ is a very much a birding term and it means little brown job so they're quite difficult to identify and quite often a few of them you can only identify by their core so james i shall search for little brown jobs on the vast expanse of Impala Plains, there is not a living, breathing soul. But 
but not an LBJ, but another one just to keep the list ticking. I wonder how many birds we're going to get on this sunrise safari. There we go. No, not the doves. Let's go up a bit. And come out slightly. And uh, let me just figure out where you are. To the right, I say. A bit more to the right. There's that pulled for a well, long way to the right. Now there. And down and left. There we go. Crowned lapwings. A pair of them. I was hoping to find a little LBJ out on the open plain, but alas, not yet. I think the best of the LBJs we got recently was down at Cheetah Plains. It was the African Pippet. So Andy and Julia are wondering whether it's true that woodpeckers are concussion-proof. Well, more so than any other animal. They've got an incredibly uh, complex shock absorber system in their skull. So imagine if you had to go whack, whack, whack and hit your head against hard pieces of wood. So yes, they do have the best way to describe it. There's lion tracks here, but under the rain, male lion tracks. Interesting. I wonder if it's the same tracks we found leaving Juma. I think it is. It is heading in the same direction. So, uh, I don't unfortunately have a, a, an image of that, but Andy and Julia, if you go Google um, woodpecker, I'm trying to think what's the, the right way to, words to put in there, uh, woodpecker skull structure, and you'll see how that shock absorber system works. Oof, even the birds. trying to hide from us, or they're hiding from the weather more than us. Uh, still on the subject of birds, Sarah Wood would like to know, do we get wood stalks in S South Africa? I'm not sure, and, and not unless they are called something else here, but I don't know of any stalks called wood stalks we get here. Uh, the stalk that comes through from Europe that we do get here is the white stalk. The same one that nests on chimneys in Germany and other parts of Europe. Uh, we get them out here during the summer months, the white stalk. So Aaron is wondering about a very strange stalk called a shoe bill. Let me see if I've got a picture. Now, Aaron's wondering if we've ever seen a shoe bill this far south. Uh, never, Aaron. Uh, the most southern recording of a shoe bill ever um, was in the Okavango Delta, and that was once in 1977-odd, if I remember correctly. And that was a very lost. Uh, normally, the most southern spot they occur is the Benguelo Swamps in northern Zambia. Um, stalk. Yes, there we go. Um, and I'll show you a picture of a shubal. It's a very funny looking creature. Where is the shubal now? Should be with the stalks, but it's not. Maybe, maybe it's under its own name, the shubal. Ah, you know why it's not in this. This is Southern Africa, and a shoe bull is generally considered a Central African bird. So unfortunately, I do not have a picture of a shoe bull with me. But, uh, they've got a very specially adapted beak. It's designed to feed on a very specific type of fish, and it's the West African lungfish. They scoop them out with that massive beak. 
that looks a bit like a boot, hence the name shoe bowl. But no, we don't get any down here. There's even quite a lot of query on the 1977 sighting of one in the Okavango Delta, whether someone might have been indulged uh, in a serious bout of G and T's when they saw that shoe bill. So they like swamps, and we don't really have too many big swamps in this part of the world. And when I say swamp, I mean a permanent swamp, not a swampy area that gets inundated during the wet season. They need a permanent swamp. Strangely enough, Aaron, we were actually discussing Shubal at dinner last night. So The last place I saw a Shubal was in Benguela in Zambia, but I have also seen them on Lake Victoria in Uganda. Ah, oh, no, left or right, Dave, you make the decision. So if we find no animals, it's your fault. Left, right or straight? Right. Dave says right. Let's see if Dave has made the right decision. Elephant tracks, but unfortunately being rained upon, so not too fresh. Sometime before 2 a.m. So, Dev, why are we going this way? I don't see any animals. Not much of a heartbeat. Huh? No, not at all. Not even a feathered heartbeat. Just a cold, gusting wind, which now Dave has made us drive directly into, so it's even colder. Let's hope Dave's decision vindicates itself. Well, a really big uh, chilly morning safari live. Welcome to Sham Sun, who's a new viewer. Uh, Sham Sun says, this looks like there's so much dung on the road. Is it elephant or buffalo? Well, it's both in a lot of cases. I will try to show you the difference now. Of course, now, as we drive down this section, there's zero dung on the road. But uh, we will definitely find some. And Sam Shang, I will show you some. Okay. Ooh. Some elephant tracks that are on top of the rain, so from this morning, yippee, and it's going, they're going that way. Hopefully, we can catch up with them. Uh, there is a buffalo pat up ahead, so that is buffalo dung there, and uh, we will try to show you some elephant dung shortly. But yes, there is indeed a lot of manure being spread around the bush. So all that dung, the nutrients from that goes back into the soil and helps the grass and the trees grow. It's amazing when, when, when you're not looking for elephant dung, it's everywhere. As soon as you start looking for it, it's nowhere. That's some fresh elephant, fresh-ish elephant dung. Not very big elephant dung though, it looks like. Here we go. You can see it through there from a youngish elephant. It's not too large. Right. having a look, it's quite fresh and there are some tracks on top of the rain. 
So I'm just going to stop and listen for a second. Let's see if we can figure out where the herd went. Oh, unfortunately, it doesn't, can't hear them, so they could be a bit far already. Seem to have been meandering around this area. Hopefully, we catch up with them. There we go, Sam Shang. You've seen the hippo. I mean, not the hippo. The elephant and the buffalo dung. Hippos spread their dung, so it's not as visible. Alas, it looks like they've gone into this very large, thick block, the elephants. Oh, there's still what looks like one walking down the road. Another impala, and with a bird on it to add it to today's sunrise safari bird list, the red-billed oxpecker. Gleaning for ectoparasites on the impala. And I've got a wonderfully specifically designed beak for this and it's almost like a little comb that they brush through the fur and they catch something down the gullet it goes. Well, that looks like a juvenile, the beaks are not fully red yet. If we look at the impala's front the left leg We'll see an adult grooming down there. You can see the red beak. So we get two species of oxpecker here. The red build and the yellow build. And the red build is the more common of the two. But it does sound like there's a nice little bird party up ahead. So let's go investigate. Maybe there'll be an LBJ for James Richard. Just trying to see if I can oh, spot them there. A bit far off the road. We're going to have to try to find a bed party that's a bit closer. So far, most of the birds I'm seeing are doves, and we've already had a look at the Cape the Turtle Dove today, and the Emble Spotted Wood Dove. Apparently we have nine birds so far on the bird list. That sounds a little bit short. What do you think, Dave? I think we've seen more than nine. Let's try it then. Cape Turtle Dove. Emerald spotted wood dove, grey hornbill, magpie shrike, crested barbet, red billed oxpecker, African hawk eagle, well done. 
Ah, crowned left wing. Ah, and uh, lesser bluey and starling. That is nine. I'm going to have to up our game here, Dave. I thought we had a, at least 15. I can hear them. Where are you hiding? On that little tip. Yeah. Let me just have a look now. Uh, come down to the left and zoom. It hasn't moved since I was. Oh dear. Notoriously difficult little critters, these. I'm going to see if I can get one to pop out into the open again. Psh, 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 psh. Hear them calling. Tiny little seed eater by the name of the blue wax bull. One more try. There we go. Go down. Oh no, no, there, there, there. Still in there, but just. There we go. There we go. Number 10. The blue wax bill. Tiny little seed eater. And quite difficult to get on camera because they are so local. A pretty little bird and off he goes. And let's fly over uh, to Steph to see what's happening on Bushwalk. Now a couple of days ago before it was it was as as moist as it is today. I think it was Aaron or James Richards, Richards has asked me for a pill millipede. Well we found one. One has come out because it's cold and it's wet today and as predicted he is around some very very old elephant dung that's busy decomposing and it's got some and and well, it's got some termite activity and the food that this particular pull millipede eats is exactly that. <clears throat> they're detritivores so they feed on fungus and bacteria and decomposing vegetable matter and that is exactly what he, this little pull millipede is busy doing at the moment. It's moving from one, air, one patch of dung to another patch of dung. Now while it's called, why it's called a pull millipede is for this reason. When you disturb them they turn themselves into a tight ball and that's what the ball looks like. That's a millipede, believe it or not. Legs and all, inside that little protective covering. Excuse my fingers in the way there, I just want to try and get them into a nice view for you. Can you believe that that is a millipede? Very, very, very prehistoric millipede. These are one of the very, very first terrestrial insects. And I mean, we're looking at an animal that's evolved over hundreds of millions of years. That's a defensive strategy. We won't be doing him any, any harm whatsoever. They're very used to being kicked around in these dung piles. And he's come out from hiding to come and show himself to us, and I'm very glad that I could uh, could get this for you. Um, James or Aaron, I can't remember which one, I think it was James. Now, as I put my rifle down here, and I'm hoping that it's still there, I caught a glimpse of one of these locusts, these stone locusts that are inhabiting the leaf, the leaf litter on top of these crests, and I'm hoping that he's actually still gonna be here. Generally, they don't like to move once you've given them a bit of a fright and the reason for that is that they rely on their camouflage to keep themselves hidden but now I, I found him you gonna have to come around this side I'm actually quite surprised that I found this little guy again I'm gonna point him out to some grass but as Jandre is busy going into as Jandre is busy going into the picture with you you're gonna have to see if you can see him and see who can see him first all right I'm gonna put my grass exactly where he is and see if you can spot him before it becomes abundantly clear what's actually there. The 
got him, John. Isn't that amazing? So there's the head. He has the very strongly developed back legs. And the abdomen lies over there. A very, very calm at the moment, taking, making absolutely no movement so that he can stay hidden from us. Very, very awesome. Almost if you blur your eyes, he disappears. And that's that counter shading that they use on their bodies, try and break up their shape. That's a tiny little locust. How awesome is that? So two birds with one stone. I've been looking for one of these locusts to show you for quite some time. And then we got to do the pull millipede as well, which is always a bonus. Now generally you'd find these pull millipedes wherever you're having decomposing vegetable matter. And of course, one of the best places to find them when it's wet like this, they tend to disappear when it's dry. I don't know where they go. They go into, ah, hang on, I'm trying to help. Here we go. I've got some branches that Jandre's giraffe-like appearance is getting stuck on at the moment. But now we come onto a crest that's dominated by these old zebra woods. And I haven't seen a living zebra wood on one of these crests. It's always just these dried up ones. Now, we've been doing a bit of trees today. And we've been doing hardwoods today as well, which is not unusual because I quite like hardwoods, but anyway, one of these hardwoods is the zebra wood. And why we call it a zebra wood is because they've got the most delightfully striped wood. Now the zebra wood is one of the hardest of the tree species here. You can see how difficult it is actually to get shavings of this wood off. Black and then at other parts It'll be white. I'm trying to find where we've got a nice striping. That one's not going to work. That is almost entirely just the heartwood that's left. So this is another piece that's white and then obviously the black on the other side. I'm actually trying to find a place where I can show you where they are both together and it's... Pr oh, there we go. <laughs> I knew I'd get there eventually. <laughs> So that's where this tree gets its name from, the zebra wood, black and white striped wood. Now, most chefs that cook out here on open fires keep a piece of the zebra wood in their kitchen store. The reason being is the white wood burns quite quickly and makes a nice quick hot flame, and the black wood burns slowly but makes a nice even coal and an even temperature. So for long cooking, they use the black wood. For quick cooking, they use the, um, they use the white wood, and quite often, it's when you're trying to seal a piece of meat, for instance, they'll chuck on uh, one of these stumps of these zebra wood, they throw it onto the fire, the white wood sears the meat, quick hot flame, and then the black wood produces a coal that makes it quite a nice, even long fire. So one of my favorite trees is uh, this zebra wood. They grow in these most abnormal of shapes. And I think it's just, this is what the heartwood looks like. The white wood gets eaten away by termites. It's much softer than what this black wood is. And the only reason that I've ever come across, well, at least deduced, on what could be the reason for these really, really bizarre shapes, is the fact that the white wood is not termite resistant, but the black heartwood is. And the termites then eat all the white wood off, leaving what is really just an exposed skeleton, really, of what's left. But you get them in the most bizarre of shapes, zebra wood. I quite enjoy that. And right here on this crest, we're seeing a lot. Yeah. Chris Applegate has said it looks like a tornado has gone through here. Chris, it's absolutely true. It does look like a tornado has gone through here. But unlike the weather phenomenon that you perhaps used to, this tornado is from elephants. Elephants are the tornadoes out here. South Africa do get tornadoes. We don't get them in this part of the world, and they're very uncommon. You're looking at less than a dozen tornadoes or reported tornadoes per year, and they're nowhere near the scale that you'd be used to in that central area in, in the U United States and in other parts of the world. <laughs> Jean-André is caught up. Stand still, I'll help you, Jean-André. Let me show you what Jean-André has been caught up in. This is what's been snagging Jean-André. 
he's been caught on those viciously hooked thorns. This dead piece of black monkey thorn has caught Jean-Dre out. Almost snagged me again on the way past. I actually want to walk up here and see if this chimney is open. I doubt it. Jean-Dre, I'm quickly going to see up here. Chimney has been closed in actual fact, but I can show you where the chimney was open. Here's the fresh side of this. Here we go. Some chakma baboons in the distance there. What are you chewing at? I must have been looking for possible grubs or insects in the dead bark there. A true omnivore, the baboon. Oh, where'd they go? Just trying to see, get another visual of them. They're back in the same area. There's impala as well. A very fluffy impala. Um, come to the right of the impala, the baboons are coming down. Yeah, whatever, eh? Where are you off to? Naughty ones, scallywags. Oh, it's a big male. He's coming right out into the open next to us. I don't think he's seen us yet. We could get, he could get a fright when he does. There's another one coming, a bigger male. And the rest of the troop slowly starting to come through now. Looks like quite a decent sized troop. A little baby playing. Approaching Central Road. They'll probably approach right there. Marula Road. Oh, look at that! It's the, the gang of youngsters. And they are relaxing down quite nicely. It's taken some time. And I think as we see them more and more, this is a constant stream running past us. Oh! Definitely something very interesting in that dead log that they're after. <laughs> so acrobatic. Oh, there's a big troop. I mean, there must have been 30 that have run past me, and it seems like another 30 still on their way. And see, there's just a constant stream opposite us of baboons. There we go, and hear them. Oh! That's the one shouting. Big male. Running behind the bush, unfortunately. Oh, with the impala to the right. Here come the end of the troop. They're going to run through the open area. There we go. That looks like the stragglers at the end. So probably about 40 or 50 baboons. Last of them about to pop up. 
right a little bit. There we go. You see that that one's got a baby clinging to its belly, oh, to its back, sorry. Cowboy baboon. And it's just having a nap on mom's back because it's cold. It's a big male coming in front of us. He's got blood on him by the looks of things. So they do fight intensely amongst each other. That looked like he had a bit of blood on his. And there's another one about to run across the road in front of us. I think that's being chased by the one with blood. There he comes. Look at him. He's a beast of a baboon. Oh, we can have a look there. He definitely does look like blood. Oh, so they've been having a big fight this morning. More than likely from the other baboons. There's still a few more. Here we go. There we go. There's the males. There's the one with the blood on his. And he's, ch he's definitely chasing that other male across in front. Here we go. Whoa, whoa. And when they fight, it can be quite intense. Let me just see if we can turn around. Let's try to stay with these two males that are chasing each other. The rest of the troop is running by on the opposite side of the road. Did you see where he went? I think that's the closest we've got to a baboon uh, since we've started seeing them again. Cut across this corner, man. No yeah, tracks there. So it looks like they might be heading towards the area around the tree house wood hole, so we'll do the same. So there's a constant battle for the dominant spots um, for the males in that baboon hierarchy. And they can get very, very vicious with each other. And as I was saying the other day, the, 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 the male baboons came out longer than the lions. Yeah. A large adult baboon is a big animal, and Anna Marie is wondering just how big, how much do they weigh? Anna Marie, they can weigh up to about 50 kilograms, a really big, big baboon, but normally a little bit less than that, around 40 or so. Looks like they changed direction and went further into the bush not coming up towards tree house as we had hoped. And they were spotted by Dave, so great spot, Dave. No. Oh, I can hear them. They're deep inside the bush now, unfortunately. There we go. A little bit further ahead. Ah, there we go. I wonder if that's the one with the, the blood, or well, it's the one running from the one with the blood. Yes, the one running from the one with the blood. Here they come. He's definitely on the case of that other baboon. I'm going to pop out right here. You can see some of the blood might not be his. It might be from another baboon he was sorting out. But it does look like he's got a little bit of stiffness in that right leg. But even though he's bleeding, it seems like he's winning. Because the other one is running from him. So 
So everyone's going to get a bit of a surprise when we arrive at the treehouse waterhole. It's just gone through a bit of a zhuzh. I think it's the correct terminology, a revamp. So there we go. They're the two males. There's the one doing the chasing and the other one is just over there walking a little bit to the right. Let's get that. You can see uh, the down wall has been rebuilt. Nice and big. So we don't have to worry about nearly falling over anymore. So we're going to stick with these baboons while they're moving just in case they do come to blows again. It is quite a spe spectacular thing to see adult male baboons fighting. Oh, I've lost on it. There he is. They're moving at quite some speed after each other. Carry on down the road or they cross over here. The last place, spot I spotted them was on this corner. Oh dear. Looks like they've managed to evade us. We'll just keep checking carefully, they might pop up again. Oh dear. Well, really interesting and really great view of baboons. And very interesting to see the blood on that one. Definitely, I would say, from that behavior, they've been fighting amongst each other for those dominant spots on the baboon social ladder. Oh, sidetracked from our birding there for a bit. Uh, while we go in search of bird number 11, and let's go see Steph, who's having incredible luck with the arachnids this morning. <laughs> we are having luck with the arachnids, except for this exact place. We had an, another one of an, we had another olive thick-tailed scorpion here, who's just actually run away underneath this log here, but I'm not going to lift up the log to show you that. What I am going to show you is this exoskeleton that I'm going to try and pick up without breaking. They're very fragile. I'm going to try and pick this one up without breaking it, and then I want to show you. Here we go. Ah. Oh. This is what happened. This particular olive thick-tailed scorpion has shed its skin and has left the exoskeleton there for us. And there we go. Have a look at that. So scorpions, ooh, see how fragile that is? Scorpions grow out of their skins and then they shed their old skin and they get into a new body when they've, when they've outgrown. And this is one of the old ones. Sorry, the, the breeze at the moment is blowing this away. And I don't want to grab it with my hands. They're incredibly fragile. What I'm going to do is maybe try and... <laughs> Today is proving very difficult. And I want to show you... I actually want to show you how they climb out. So let me grab it and see if we can do it this way. There we go. So the scorpion would have popped the lid there in the front, looking at the lid, I'll put it sideways for you, popped the lid and then climbed out, claws, insides, tail, sting, pincers, everything, would have climbed out and then spent some time drying. But just, sorry, the wind is playing havoc with us today. Have a look inside there. Well, well no. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, there on the bottom, I want to show you something that is quite rare to see for scorpions. Have a look at that bright white patch in the middle of the scorpion's body. Just in front of them, you're going to see a V. There where my fingernail is, 
at the moment. Those are called pectines. And those combs are how the male scorpion feels the ground. I'm going to hold this one. We can risk breaking it. There the pectines are. Let me get a piece of grass. Hold on one second for me while I just bend down quickly and go get a piece of grass so that I can use it as a... As a marking stick for you. But there are the pectines right there. Now that the scorpion will unfold and when this male scorpion, and I'm going to tell you now while I think it's a male, will be dancing with the female, he'll be feeling the ground of those pectines. He will then deposit a sperm packet onto the ground when he's made a suitable discovery and by suitable discovery what needs to happen is he needs to deposit his sperm packet on the ground at such an angle that when he pulls the female over it her body keys to that sperm packet and accepts it and there you can see the pectines there they're very delicate and something you don't see on a scorpion so why I think it's a male have a look at his pincers very long slender pincers Females pincers are more robust. Now quite difficult to, for me to, without a female, to actually show you exactly what I mean by more robust, but they'd be definitely shorter and they'd have a more pronounced bulge. That's a female. So I think this is a male olive thick-tailed scorpion. He would grab the female basically in his pincers and then dance her over an area. They dance backwards and forwards. He dances her over the area. These pectines fan out and he feels over the ground where he wants to deposit this particular packet of sperm. He deposits the sperm packet and then he dances the female over that sperm packet until her body accepts it. And then once her body's accepted it, he releases her or they release each other and carry on with their day. And this dance can actually go on for some time, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours even, until this male has figured out the exact ground where he can deposit the sperm packet for, the, for his lady. Now, a scorpion like this as well gives us the chance for us to examine how deadly this tail is. Have a look at that. Now that obviously hasn't got the venom glands in. The sting, the venom glands sit inside there. The actual end of the digestive system, the anus of the scorpion, lies there, believe it or not. And this tail is just one big muscle used to drive that sting into prey that's held with the pincers. Now, I'm going to teach you a little thing about how to tell poisonous scorpions or dangerous scorpions from non-dangerous scorpions. A dangerous scorpion is a scorpion that has relatively thick tail when compared to its pincers. So here you can see that the pincers are very delicate but the tail is very robust. And this means there should be a clear warning to me not to play with the scorpion. If it was the other way around, if the pincers were very robust and the sting and the tail were underdeveloped when compared to the pincers, then it's a scorpion that, you, that is probably not that dangerous. Now this is obviously a rule of thumb. Your local scorpions might be slightly different, but as a general rule of thumb, thick tail, skinny pincers, dangerous. Thin tail, big pincers, not that dangerous. This is the rule of thumb. This is a slightly dangerous, the olive thick tailed scorpion definitely will, he'll definitely let you know you're there by the way. <laughs> no painkiller is going to save you on that one. I'm going to put this back, I just think these things are so amazing. And then I need to track down my rifle. There we go. <laughs> All right. Let's carry on going. All right, now we've come out on this crest dominated by an actual Strychnos thicket. This is a thicket of Strychnos Madagascariensis or the monkey orange, the black monkey orange. You'd know it from the screeching that it makes down the sides of the vehicles. And this is a smallish thicket that do get quite big here. But um, while we're making our way over this crest and finding other interesting things for you, we're going to be sending you through to Brent. He's got an update for you.
So we're in the Mawati River. And what we're doing is we're trying to find bird number 11 for our morning's bird list. And as it gets cooler and colder and the wind starts blowing, finding that 11th bird is becoming a bit like the 11th hour. Because we're very close. We just have, sorry, we see Dave's just maneuvering the aerial so we can go under a branch. I was hoping that it's a little bit more protected down here amongst the trees. The wind's not getting in here, so I was hoping maybe we could find an interesting bird down in the drainage system. It's very quiet at the moment. Not even the normal gaudy red and yellow billed hornbills are about. I'm checking for any slight flicker of a wing in the trees. Anything flying over with the clouds. Yeah. Well, if this is not working, we're going to have to try a different area. I have not even seen a bird disappear down here. Brian is wondering if I ever come across an animal that I was particularly surprised to find in that particular location. Uh, I suppose yes, Brian. I mean, uh, we're always exhilarated and surprised when we find pangolin, even though we know they're here, they're just so hard to see. But I think for me, I think the most surprised I've been since I've been here is when, and I didn't even see it, so I only saw the, the, the screenshots from the dam cam, was when that sable antelope arrived at uh, the Juma Dam. That was very surprising. Even though they do occur in and around this area, uh, it was definitely since I've been here the first sable on Juma. It looks like all the birds are trying to huddle and keep warm and stay out of sight. going to the Mulwati Arch, as I like to call it. There's this russet bush willow that has fallen a little bit from the bank and created this beautiful little arch over the riverbed. Not quite the Arc de Triomphe, but still beautiful nonetheless. Okay, so no birds in the drainage system, so let's try up on the edge. Maybe we'll find the 11th bird at the 11th hour. No eddies today. We, I mean, we heard some and we saw some tracks, but I haven't seen one yet. That should be the first drive in quite a while that I haven't not seen elephant. But the drive's not over yet. There's still always a chance. Ooh. 
this is actually crazy now. I mean, we can't see a bird anywhere. I just keep looking everywhere. Like they've all gone to sleep. Even the doves that were everywhere on the ground earlier are nowhere to be seen. The 11th bird! Hiding. Oh, running. <laughs> there he goes. Um, I should come out on the other side of that bush shortly. There he goes, to the right. There we go. Uh, Crested Franklin uh, disappearing. Here we go, bird number 11. And uh, not a very... Oh, as you know, I thought not a very, very helpful bird because he hasn't really hung around for us to get a look. But nonetheless, it is the 11th bird and not quite the 11th hour. But at least we got, even if it was just the shortest sighting of Queen Cruda. I actually remembered another bird we saw that we didn't count, Dave. The grey go-away bird. So it's actually 12 birds. So we haven't been in search of the 11th bird, the 12th bird. Now we're in search of the 13th. I think we might get the 13th species around the Juma Dam Cam. Maybe there could be some uh, blacksmith lapwings around. And if we join our bird list with Steph, we get a purple roller as well. And uh, apparently they might be the purple roller's cousin, the lilac breasted roller at the dam cam. So we shall rush to see if we can find it, unless we spot another bird along the way. Or an animal with a heartbeat and fur, and warm-blooded, and mammalian, like the male in Yala. Also looking quite fluffy and unimpressed with this cold weather, ruminating away. Quite a nice big male, you can see the white tips on the horns. I really love the chevron. Chevron's that little white bar between its eyes. See how its ears are constantly working, constantly listening, even though he doesn't look like he's alert. He most certainly is. See, checking behind him with his ears, taking to the side, and working that cud. Chewing away. Oh, boom. and swallowed. Now, next lot coming up from the gallops. So we'll leave him to ruminate in peace while we try to make our way towards the lilac breasted roller. So it seems like the 11th hour is upon us and uh, we might not make it. Oh, but we'll get white helmet shrikes and those will suffice. Oh, we'll get two bird species here. Now, that of course is not a white helmet shrike. That is a common scimitar bull. And the white helmet shrikes are in the tree next to it. Oh, yes. There we go. There <laughs> we go. Beautiful little elf elfy goes. There we go, common scimitar and white helmet shrikes, a double bill to end uh, the bird 
adventure. We will go on for a little bit. Could we get possibly just one more? It looks like the hour is reached. Uh, it's been wonderful having you on the drive with us this morning. Hopefully we'll be back to two vehicles on the Sunset Safari. Uh, if not, you'll see us again. But finally the leopard drought has ended and uh, we're going to say goodbye and see you in a few short, few short hours. But before we do that, let's have one last look at something we've been looking for all morning. A zebra. And uh, from the zebra uh, to Sir Not Such a Stripey Fellow on the bushwalk, Steph. So not quite a zebra or a nyala or the 100,000 birds that Brent's trying to find for you today. But this is for me one of the most hardcore and best kept secrets of the, uh, of, of the Sabi Sands. It's an, it's an intact and very healthy seep line. And this particular grass is where the seep comes to light. It's where the, 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 the water wells up in these areas. And subterraneanly here, there's lots and lots of water. This is not wet because of the rain today. It is a little bit, but it's actually wet because even though I'm going deeper than the one millimeter I did this morning, you can see the ground stays wet. This is our seep line and this grass denotes it. Why I love this grass. This grass grows in quite a hardcore area. It grows in an area where there's too much water for trees to germinate and too much water for other grasses to germinate. And so this grass sticks out like a sore thumb. And what it tries to do as much as possible is to remain unappetizing for insects and birds. And you can see there, there's very small seeds so that the birds don't eat them. But how would this tree, or how would this grass then, excuse me, help protect itself from insects that maraud its seeds? And it does that by exuding a gum. On that node, there's sticky, that's sticky. And it stops ants from crawling up the grass stem, passing this node, and then walking up to steal the, the seeds. So this tree keeps itself or well, this grass, excuse me, I don't know why I keep on messing that up, but this grass keeps itself being unappetizing. Small seeds to stop the birds from eating it, gum all over the nodes here to stop the ants from crawling up this, this particular grass. One of the most hardcore grasses out here, one of my favorite things in the Sabi Sands is this particular grass. It's called uh, gummy fluor. It's a gum grass. Aerogrostis gummy fluor is the name of this particular grass. But on that note, today's been a pretty quiet drive, nice rain this morning, beautiful scenery, thickets, Tambueti thickets, and... <laughs> X-Ray Angus made a nice comment now on my closing, which has just thrown me. So am I judging from my scorpion dance that I did, would I be a good dancer? x Ranger? I'm absolutely not a good dancer at all. I dance like something's wrong with me and it's usually another case. But anyway, from the bushwalk and the bushwalk crew, from all of us here at, at, uh, at Wild Earth and Safari Love, we're going to say thank you for joining us for this morning's bushwalk. Uh, myself and Jandre and Hubert especially have enjoyed answering all your questions and we will catch up with you definitely tomorrow for another one. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.